All right. I say we, we can get started. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our talk on invasive aquatic species here in Nebraska. Uh, my name is Laura Kasney, and I will be hosting the event tonight. I am a conservation director serving Southeast Nebraska for the AmeriCorps Common Ground Program. The Common Ground Program holds educational webinars and events about conservation issues such as water quality, clean energy, and soil health. We focus on educating the public and preserving Nebraska's natural legacy. A couple of items before we start. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those in the Q&A option uh, below at the bottom of your screen uh, during our question segment at the end or during the uh, during the presentation. Oh. Sorry, uh, during our question segment at the end, you will be asked to fill out a three question poll regarding this event tonight. Uh, we would love for you to complete this as it helps us measure our outreach and is used for great reporting purposes so we can continue doing events like these. Um, also, this event is being recorded and it will be put up on the Conservation Nebraska website in the next few days. Uh, today, we are joined by Allison Zach. She is the Invasive Species Program Coordinator coordinator for all state and federal agencies and non-governmental organizations involved in invasive species research, management, and policy across the state of Nebraska. Uh, she also develops materials for educational outreach regarding research and management of invasive species. So Allison, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about zebra mussels and um, quagga mussels, but I'm also going to talk about some other aquatic invasive species of concern in Nebraska. And as I go along, go ahead and type any questions um, into that chat and um, we'll be sure to ask them, answer those as we go along as well. So what is the Nebraska Invasive Species Program? If you've never heard of it, uh, we're located in the University of Nebraska in the wildlife uh, co-op research unit, and um, it is a grant-funded program with funding from the Game and Parks Commission and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with other uh, donors. And our mission is to be a clearinghouse of information on invasive species of all taxa. So today I'm going to be talking to you about aquatic invasive species, but in the future, if you'd like to learn more about terrestrial invasive species, wildlife, insects, anything like that, I'd be happy to help you with that as well. And at the end, you'll see my website, which has lots of great references um, and information on species we won't talk about today. I also coordinate the Nebraska Invasive Species Program, which is comprised of federal, state, and nonprofit um, organizations and resource agencies. So those people with boots on the ground and, and many years of experience with invasive species, uh, we all come together on a monthly basis and you're always welcome to join our monthly meetings. And finally, I employ uh, seasonal technicians that are right now out in the field doing boat inspections and outreach. So a lot of what, what I'm doing is education and outreach and, and I'm happy to you know, impart some knowledge on you today and hope that in the future, uh, that I can help you learn about other invasive species. So if you've never heard of a zebra or quagga mussel, these are little uh, mollusks. So they have two shells, kind of like a clam. Um, they get as large as about your thumbnail. So I've actually seen zebra mussels that can get larger, um, but it's very dependent on the amount of, of food and, and habitat um, available in a water body. So generally these are gonna be about the size of your thumbnail when they're adults. Uh, zebra mussels, we call them that because they have these stripes on them and you'll see them on the top here. Um, they, they, do, uh, they don't all look alike. So some have very few stripes, some have a lot of stripes. So they do uh, differ. And then on the bottom are quagga mussels. And you'll see those quagga mussels are actually kind of um, sitting straight up and down. And so they, they do look a little different uh, than zebra mussels. And they're actually worse in a lot of ways than zebra mussels because unlike zebra mussels, they don't have to cement themselves to a substrate to live. So for instance, if we were to get quagga mussels in Nebraska at let's say a sand pit lake, which might not have a lot of sediment, uh, might not have a lot of uh, rocks in it or logs or anything for those uh, zebra mussels to attach to, but those quagga mussels would just do fine there. So even um, though we do have zebra mussels, we have no quagga mussels in the state and we hope to keep it that way. So these are both fresh, fresh water mus mol mollusks. Um, I'll talk about where they're from, but they can uh, sustain some salinity. So they can stand some water that is more, um, has more salt in it. They don't just need fresh water. On average, they live two to five years. And once they settle as adults, 
um, they can actually, when they're adults with those fully formed shells, they can live out of water for up to 30 days. They can just clam up. And if they're in a, a situation that is dark and has moisture in it, they can actually live just fine. And so that's one of the main challenges is these guys can get around on boats and equipment very easily. And that's how, unfortunately, humans, we, we're the main way that these guys are getting around. And then the villagers, which are the, the actual um, the larva, those are gonna be invisible to the naked eye. And those can be in residual water in let's say a boat motor or a live well. And if that water gets flushed into another water body, that's how those villagers can be moved from one water body to another. So like I said, zebra mussels are really small. And I'm, I'm glad that I do get calls all the time with people saying, hey, I think I found a zebra mussel. And they're actually reporting our native mussels. And our native mussels are gonna be more like the size of your hand versus those zebra and quagga mussels are more like the size of your thumbnail. So if you see something big that has that is a mollusk, it has two shells um, and it's bigger, please do send me a, a picture if you're interested. But these, na these native mussels are extremely important. They um, detoxify our water, so they take it. They uh, filter feed all those chemicals and other impurities out of our rivers and our lakes, and they're extremely important part of the food chain um, for, let's say, otters and a lot of other wildlife species depend on them for food. And so we're actually growing a lot of these native mussels to put them back in our river systems um, because they have been decimated over time. So native mussels, really great things. We have about 13 species in Nebraska. Um, Many less of those are commonly found, but native mussels are really important. And so if you find them, that's a good thing. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of good things about zebra and quagga mussels to talk to you about. So the first picture here shows a, a boat uh, prop covered in um, zebra mussels. And so what happens with these guys is um, when they reproduce, you're gonna have this larva that's gonna be free flo floating in the water. And if you leave your, your boat prop and, and your engine in the water when you, when you park it, uh, let's say you put it on a, a boat lift and you leave that in the water, then those larvae can get in the water, the intakes of that engine start growing and overheat and actually break that motor. So if you take a boat up, let's say to Lewis and Clark Lake and you were to leave the, the motor in the water, this is what those motors over time look like. And so people have to replace their motors at times because um, that kind of damage. Another thing to note is zebra and quagga mussels have extremely sharp shells. And so um, people cut their feet all the time. And so if you think about your favorite beach to go to or your favorite place to go swimming, if you get zebra or quagga mussels at that water body, you're gonna have to wear um, water shoes. And also you may have to pay somebody to actually rake that beach so that you can walk on the beach. So um, not only is it is it costly uh, equipment wise if you're a boater, but even if you just like going to a water body, it can really change um, how that water body is to go recreate at. Um, each zebra mussel or quagga mussel will filter feed about a liter of water a day, every one of them. And when a water body is infested with these guys, you're gonna have thousands of these coating the bottom of the lake, filter feeding all that good plankton and all that um, food that other aquatic uh, organisms depend on. And so they're taking all that plankton out of the water, uh, which has cascading effects to the whole uh, food chain. And so that's one, another reason where um, in the eco, in the food web, zebra and quagga mussels really just mess everything up and have huge cascading effects. We spend millions of dollars every year um, trying to remove zebra and quagga mussels from power facilities. So this would be a, a picture here of a power facility um, where they take water in from a river, for example, that has zebra mussels in it, those intake pipes get covered in these shells and then they have to pay people uh, to go and remove all those shells and clean those out um, multiple times a year. So an example of this would be, um, we have a, a um, OPPD facility uh, with Power for Omaha, Nebraska, pulling water out of the Missouri River. And so they have had to put in systems to keep their pipes clean and do maintenance like this. And so of course, um, then those costs could be passed on to those, those people in Omaha that get power from those facilities. And so even if you're not a boater, even if you don't like to go to a lake for fun, you do care about your power bill. And so that's one thing that I try to let people know that even if you don't own a boat or go fishing, zebra and quagga mussels can impact your life. Another thing is, of course, they clog pipes. And so when we look at out Western Nebraska, if we were to get zebra or quagga mussels out there, um, they can clog irrigation pipes. So if we were to get them, let's say in Lake McConaughey, and then it were to go and, and you know, not only make that hydro dam and, and those um, canals 
um, ineffective. And also you'd have to pay for chemicals to get those clean. And so with irrigation and, and not only with power, but also with, with municipal water, right? So we pull water out of some water bodies to then um, have municipal water for people to drink or use on their, in their lawns. And so those would be examples of where quagga and zebra mussels can have impacts to those systems. And then finally, um, just two other wildlife, right? So you have these native mussels here and over time, you, they'll get zebra mussels attached to them and they'll just die. And so um, that's just one example of, of the other spe species that are really impacted by zebra and quagga mussels. So the reason zebra and quagga mussels are such a problem to control is they have extremely prolific reproduction. So a single female, will we'll produce 40,000 to a million eggs a year. Okay, so a single female will release eggs into a water body and they do this when the water temperature is above 56 degrees Fahrenheit. So all summer long, um, the males and the females are gonna be reproducing in a, a water body that has zebra mussels, let's say. So the, the males will, will um, produce sperm, females eggs, those will combine that will produce the larva. And those larvae are gonna be free floating in the water column for about two weeks until they, they gain some weight when they're forming their shells and then they will sink. And with zebra mussels, they need to find something to attach to to live. So of course about 95% of those larvae are not gonna make it. But even with that 5%, if you think of every single female having 40,000 eggs, it very quickly becomes a water body with with the bottom covered with zebra mussels, any of that substrate that's there, okay? So it's, it's, that, it's that prolific reproduction, uh, which means that even if we try to take um, some action to reduce the populations or eradicate it, if you don't take out 100% of the, the population, you will have uh, reoccurrences because of this proliferation. So um, all summer long, if the water temperatures above 56 degrees and um, they're reproducing, you're going to have this larva free floating in that water and that water column. And so that's where if you put a jet ski on the lake, if you have a bait bucket and you take that water from one water body to another, those are the ways that that water could have those larva and move to another water body. And then we already talked about that the adult mussels themselves could actually attach themselves to a boat and move from one water body to another. Um, they normally will not do that within you know, if you're just on the, the lake for a couple hours, but if you are to dock that boat, leave it, you know, for a day or so on that water body, then they could attach that boat and move to another. So um, both are, are unfortunately a vector that make them very transmissible from one, one water body to another. So I mentioned cascading effects to the, to the uh, food chain when it comes to zebra mussels. And how this is happening is that filter feeding. So you have these zebra or quagga mussels that are gonna be filter feeding that water and they're taking out all the plankton. Well, what that's gonna do is that's gonna allow um, light to penetrate deeper into the water column and that can actually increase um, vegetation growth. And so a lot of people, when you think, hey, wouldn't a clear lake be amazing, right? Wouldn't it be great to be able to just see to the bottom of that lake? The thing that happens when you do that is you have other impacts. So one thing that's gonna happen is the habitat is gonna change because you're gonna have more vegetative growth. And with that more vegetative growth, you can displ displace other desired or native species. You can also have blue-green algae blooms more frequently. And so if you're not familiar with blue-green algae, it is toxic to animals like, like pets and also to humans. So um, blue-green algae, it looks kind of like paint is just poured on top of the water. And when that occurs, um, of course, you'll see signs that say, hey, this beach is closed. And so when you actually get more zebra or quagga mussels in a water body, that can occur more quickly or more frequently throughout the season. And so that's just another reason why zebra and quagga mussels are not only an, is an issue for um, the, the food chain, but then also for human and, and safety of pets. And just to mention why that happens. So zebra and quagga mussels um, can taste um, certain types of, of plankton, such as that, that um, bacteria that is blue-green algae, and they will just spit it out. And so they say, hey, this doesn't taste right, and they spit it out because it's toxic. And so that's why those blue-green algae blooms become more frequent if you have these populations. It's also one of the reasons we have a really hard time finding a chemical to make them eat it and kill them because they sense the chemical and they say, I'm not eating that, spit it out and clam up. 
Um, and so we'll talk more about why we're having so many challenges of actually finding a chemical or something that we can treat and actually eradicate uh, zebra and quagga mussels in an open water system. So where are zebra mussels from? They're actually native to the lakes south of Russia. So on the left here is the native range of zebra and quagga mussels. And so, like I said, they can tolerate some salinity, um, but these are freshwater lakes that they're native to. And you'll see on the right there is how they've expanded. So of course, there's been a lot of canal systems in Asia and Europe and a lot of transport uh, between water bodies. And so you've seen that they have really increased um, where they are currently in Europe and, and Asia. And you might ask, okay, well, how do we get them, them here in the United States? And what happened in, in the United States is a these large cargo ships coming to us from uh, these, these areas in, in Europe uh, we'll, we'll take up ocean, we'll take up water where they're at port. So the water that they took up had zebra and quagga mussel larva adults in it. They took it over to the Great Lakes and they would dump it. And so by the late 1980s, we had both zebra and quagga mussels in the Great Lakes. And that's the first place that they got into the United States. And that's due to those, those large ballast ships. And so you'll see this, this large, this is the current uh, zebra and quagga mussel range map for the United States and, and even into Canada for you. And you'll see in the Great Lakes region, we just have this huge, um, huge amount of dots, right? So that was kind of the, the initial introduction there. And then since then, boats, humans, uh, other equipment has is how this is spread. So unfortunately, um, like I said, the adults can live out of water 30 days plus. They have found on, on houseboats that are, let's say at Lake Powell, that sit there for months at a time, they will actually get, you know, like layers of, of zebra and quagga mussels on them. And so they found that in storages, there's actually zebra and quagga mussels living six months later because they're in the right conditions to still be alive. Um, so unfortunately these guys can live um, out of water very well and then also those larvae. And so that's how we, we have been spreading them. A really positive thing to show you is that Nebraska is on the leading edge going west for zebra and quagga mussels. And so since 2009, we've been conducting a lot of outreach. Uh, we've been conducting research with boater surveys and inspecting boats. And there's a reason that Nebraska does not have more um, infestations with zebra and quagga mussels. We're putting a lot of work in and the public is doing the right thing. They're clean, draining and drying. So Nebraska really is a success story of, of that we've put a lot of resources into prevention and education and um, and, and it's all about you know learning about this and then spreading the word. So appreciate your attention today and, and hope that you can help us spread the word to make Nebraska stay like this and, and prevent these, these zebra and quagga mussels from going west. So this is our current uh, range map in Nebraska. So you'll notice again, we don't have any quagga mussels. We've never found quagga mussels in Nebraska, but we do currently have four water bodies that are uh, positive for zebra mussels. And what positive means is that we have found a population there. So we verified, yep, that there were zebra mussels there. Um, and then we, the positive is a designation that for the next five years, it will stay positive. And then we could delist it if we don't find zebra mussels after that amount of time. So um, Lewis and Clark Lake, which is right by, right, right by Yankton, South Dakota, um, it's a border water. So part of it's in South Dakota and part of it's in Nebraska. So we have Wygon Marina in Nebraska. And if you go there, there are zebra mussels in that water body. There's larvae and adults. Um, you definitely don't see zebra mussels as much as you saw, let's say five years ago, uh, when we first you know, saw the infestation um, early on. Um, and so people wonder, did they go away? And unfortunately they don't go away. They kind of go up boom and bust when they first get established because um, they reproduce really quickly and they kind of eat themselves out of house and home, right? So they just, they take up all of all of the substrate, they eat all the plankton and then they kind of crash, but don't worry, they, they come back, unfortunately. Um, and so if you do go to Liston Clark Lake, it's important to clean, drain and dry. Um, we do have a, a boat cleaning unit at Wagon Marina where you can use uh, to clean your boat. It's not decontamination, but it's a way to vacuum off and blow off water from your, your boat. And then in the whole Missouri River, we have zebra mussels. And so anytime you go to the Missouri River with a boat, with fishing, with anything, we need you to clean, drain and dry that because there are zebra mussels in the river. Glen Cunningham, a lot of people know it as Cunningham Lake in Omaha. Um, we did find zebra mussels in that in, in 2017, uh, 2018. We drew it down in 2018 and let it sit over the wintertime to freeze and kill them. It was a new small infestation we found. 
Um, they did a renovation on the lake and now they're planning to open the lake sometime this summer or, or the fall. They're still kind of working that out. So Glen Cunningham Lake or Lake Cunningham is technically a positive water body for the next five years. Um, but for all intensive purposes, we believe that eradication should have been effective because we drew it down, we froze them out. Um, and of course there'll be lots of monitoring. And so you'll, you'll uh, be able to see on my website if we do find them again. Finally, off at Air Force Base Lake, which is in Bellevue, Nebraska. Um, it's a small lake, right? But it was actually um, a borrow pit. That's how they actually built the runway off at Air Force Base. And this is the borrow pit that they made into a lake. And so a lot of uh, military families go there. You can, you can camp there and, and fish there. Um, this actually, back in 2008, they tried to treat this with copper sulfate, uh, 2008, 2009. Um, unfortunately, we went back in 2014 and they were back. And so that's an example of, um, unless you kill 100%, they will come back. It'll take them four or five years to repopulate uh, slowly, but just an, an example there that the copper sulfate was not effective uh, at eradicating them there. So to this day, it's still a positive water body. And this summer, they're actually doing boat ins boat. Uh, they're doing inspections of people to kind of learn more about the public and how people use the lake. So that'll be important uh, data that we can learn more about off of with. Finally, Carter Lake. So Carter Lake is right by the Omaha airport. It is shared between Omaha and, and Omaha. And um, so that's a lake that we have found a villager at during a single uh, water sampling, but we haven't verified it. And so it's still just this suspect. If we are, if we do verify that, yep, we found some more zebra mussel, we found an adult or we found some larva, then that will become a positive water body. But for now, we're just uh, monitoring it and, and learning more about kind of the boaters that use that lake in case it does become positive. So our sampling method right now to detect zebra and quagga mussels is kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, unfortunately. And this is what most of the states in the Western United States use. And what we do is we take a plankton net and we throw it out. It's attached to a rope. We then reel that back in. And when we're reeling that back in, it is filtering gallons of water. And, and there's a little cod piece on the end. We pick it up and that little cod piece on the end has a filter in it. And it's a 64 micron filter. So it's very small, what stays in that cup. And so what we do is we take that cup we rinse it out into a bottle, and then we look at the contents of that cup under a microscope. And so what we're, what we're trying to find is the zebra or quagga mussel larva, if there is any in that water body. But if you think of a lake like Lake McConaughey or just, you know, Lewis and Clark Lake, some really large reservoir or water body, this is literally a needle in a haystack. And so our method um, for sampling them is, is not the best right now. Um, but of course, in Nebraska, we are sampling um, all of our high use water bodies and we're doing it throughout the season. So um, whenever we do find uh, mussels, you can again, come to my website and you can find that out. Um, but thankfully we've stayed pretty fluid in not having you know, new water bodies every year because people are clean draining and drying and, and preventing their spread. I do have good news about detection though. So this is not a gloom and doom thing. This is, this is where we're at currently, but I think in the future, we're gonna be at a better place to have even earlier detection of zebra and quagga mussels. This is an interesting kind of case story for you at Lewis and Clark Lake. We had been doing those plankton samples on the Nebraska side and the South Dakota side every summer, um, just like we do our other lakes. And we were finding no, we were finding no larva. But then um, in South Dakota, the, the a biologist found a zebra mussel uh, shell on a boat at a boat shop and said, hmm, I'm gonna go to the marina and look more. And he and others went out and started snorkeling, felt the, the bottom side of all the boat lifts and lo and behold, there was a zebra mussel on every one of those boat lifts. So somehow our method for detection with those plankton toes weren't finding any larva, but guess what? There were adults there the entire time. So um, another thing that we, we do in Nebraska and other states do is, is substrate sampling, right? So we look at docks when they get pulled out of the water in the fall time. We look at rocks. We, we walk around the edge of water bodies to look at rocks, pick them up from outside from the water and say, hey, is there any mussels on them? So that's, that's a nice thing too, is that we're, we're not only just using that, looking for the larva, we're also trying to look for the adults because of this cat case study right here, where we didn't find any larva, but the adults were there the whole time. And this was right when that, that infestation of zebra mussels was new. And so you'll see just everything is covered here. These are all the undersides of, of boat lifts. Um, but by year four or five, you don't see this. And that's why people think, oh, the zebra mussels are gone. But again, it's just this boom and bust that 
they just they just all kind of crash and then they'll come back. So uh, if you go to Lewis and Clark now, it definitely doesn't look like this, but they are still there. Uh, when I when I talk to the public about mussels, often they think of what you get on a dinner plate, right? To eat at a restaurant, this big kind of mussel that's pretty big, you know, and you can see from far away. But the reality is zebra mussels, like I said, are the size of your thumbnail when they're adults or even smaller when they're juveniles. And they like to be in the nooks and crannies underneath your boat um, or on trailers, any of the above. They're looking for those nooks and crannies that are protected, dark. And um, so this, for an example, is, is underneath a pontoon, um, you know, and that, that's pretty hard to, to see if you don't know what you're looking for. So um, we have inspectors in Nebraska um, out inspecting boats all summer long, looking in the nooks and crannies to find any mussels. Um, but this is just something you can pass on others is that these mussels are really little, they're dark, and they're in the nooks and crannies under these boats or, or yeah. So um, difficult to see and dark unless you know what you're looking for. And then the villagers, this is actually on the right what they look like as, as they're settling. So this is where they're probably getting in that two week age, age range where they're actually forming shells and they look gelatinous. And so when we're inspecting boats, what we're looking for with this is we're feeling the side of the boat and if it feels dirty, crusty, or slimy, that's that's a telltale sign to us that we need to pay attention because that could be zebra or quagga mussel larva or other aquatic invasives. So um, like I said, they are invisible in, in the water column, but when they start settling, they do look gelatinous like this, and it feels like sandpaper. So if you ever feel the side of your boat and it feels like sandpaper, um, definitely clean it well and don't, don't launch it until you do somewhere else. So the places that we want you to inspect and to just clean very well and dry before you launch into another water body would be um, anything that gets in the water. So that includes your anchor, your anchor lines, life jackets, um, storage compartments, leave them open, let them dry, live wells, make sure you drain them completely, remove your drain plug, let it out, make sure that's completely dry before you go somewhere else. Um, and then of course, underneath the boat, all those nooks and crannies, uh, look at the bunks on, on your trailer or the rollers, these are all just kind of the areas, and this is on my website too, if you want to refer to this in the future or send somebody else. The important thing to do is clean, drain, and dry. People ask all the time, do I need to use chemicals? You know, what do I need to do? And it, it's three simple steps. The first thing is to inspect that boat. You look at the prop, you look underneath, you look in the trailer. Are there any plant parts? Is there any mud? Are there any organisms? If so, remove them right there while you're, while you're at the boat, you know, ramp, parking area leave before you leave, uh, put them in the trash um, and then make sure you drain. So if you have any drain plugs, remove the drain plug for that live well, make sure you, you let all that water drain out um, and then wipe it out with a sponge or towel, just make sure it's, it's bone dry and then clean that boat when you get home, right? So if there's any areas that are crusty, if there's dirt on it, if there's plants, use um, soap and water and, and a hose and, and high pressure if you need to. Um, you can take it to a car wash if you need to, but it really is about everything being dry, everything being clean because zebra quagga mussels need moisture. They need um, it to be dark. It, it, they can't get really hot, right? So if, if your boat is clean, dry and, and hot and everything is dry, that's, what, that's what's gonna prevent them from being able to continue to live out of water. Another important thing to do is never release any bait fish, worms, anything into a water body, because that's one way that other aquatic invasive um, organisms and diseases can be spread in water bodies. So one thing with zebra and quagga mussels is we lack a control method currently. So in an open lake setting, there isn't a, con there isn't a chemical or a product on the market right now that we can pour into a lake that will kill an established zebra mussel population. There are a couple um, chemicals that are, that are approved for treating zebra and quagga mussels, but that's more at um, closed systems, such as in a pipe system or at a new infestation, let's say at a boat launch, you could potentially treat at a very localized area, but not on a whole lake, lake scale. So it really is about prevention uh, with zebra mussels. Now, maybe in the future, we will find something that works great and is affordable, um, but we're not there by any means at this time. But there is millions of dollars of research going into control methods um, for an open water system. So it's not that people are not trying to find that. It's just a tough thing. So the final thing with zebra mussels I wanted to talk about was decontamination. And so if you ever heard, if you ever hear the word decontamination, 
Um, several states, even boarding Nebraska, such as Colorado, if you take a boat, a motorboat from Nebraska to Colorado to go launch it, um, it's likely they will decontaminate your boat. And what they're going to use is a high pressure, high temperature unit. And so what the, what the purpose of that unit is, is to kill the aquatic invasive species. And so they've actually done lab studies to determine 140 degree uh, temperatures for 10 seconds will kill an adult zebra quagga mussels and 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit will kill larva. And so you'll see on the right here, this pressure unit, that's a decontamination occurring of a watercraft. And so um, just to be clear that a decontamination is different than clean, drain, dry, um, but the clean draining and drying is, is a way to uh, prevent their spread as well. So what is being done? The good news is, is lots of work is being done and the majority of people that we survey and inspect their boats in Nebraska are clean, draining and drying. And that's the most important way to protect our water bodies. And so this is a picture right here of a technician and she is interviewing the boaters, asking them where they were last with this watercraft, how many days it's been out of the water, where they might go next, do they have a live well? And then they inspect and they look in that live well. And so they're inspecting that boat and you'll see that she has a tablet with her. And what she's doing, she's actually logging that data into a, a system that's used by all the locations on the right here. So in the Western United States and even in, in uh, Canada now, um, there are different places conducting watercraft inspections using this data sharing system. And this data sharing system is sharing information of what we found during those inspections. And so it'll say, well, we found, you know, we found some, wa some water on this watercraft, we decontaminated the watercraft, and then the we put that record in the system. And so what that's allowing that, that person to do is that we can then look at that data at the end of the season or even during the season to look at kind of uh, travel patterns to better protect our water bodies and also um, to look at that data and to do risk assessments to learn more about uh, kind of travel patterns and, and identify those risks. So really helpful system, lots of great data that we're just now collecting on a very large scale. Um, and it will help not only federal and state agencies and other resource agencies in the future. So it's really exciting. There is lots of research on, detec on detection and treatments underway. So on the left, you may have heard of the word Zequinox. And what Zequinox is, is actually a Pseudomonas uh, bacteria. So it's a type of bacteria that occurs in the soil. So it's in your backyard right now. Uh, they kill that bacteria and then they feed it to zebra and quagga mussels and it will actually kill them. It works great in a lab, right? You put it in this tank, they eat it, they die. The problem is when you get to an open lake setting like this, keeping that concentration of Zequinox at the bottom of the lake for long enough for those zebra and quagga mussels to eat it and die, it's very, very difficult. And so we're still doing trial um, trials with the, with Earth Tech QZ, which is a copper product, but then also with, Q, with Zequinox, which is bacteria to, you know, gain some perspective and learn, you know, in the future, is there going to be something that would actually work in a whole like setting? Because right now we, we really just are not there. Finally, with detection, the, the, Hope that I have is that in the future, environmental DNA is going to be, um, it's, we're going to have methods and protocols so that we can sample large reservoirs and lakes um, using environmental DNA. And it will, it will find for us zebra and quagga mussel much quicker than our current uh, plankton, our plankton uh, net toes right now. So uh, right now I was part of a study here in Nebraska as, as are others um, taking water samples and they're gonna comp compare that sampling method with that plankton net sampling method I showed you so that we can, final we can finalize kind of how we do that in the field, how we do that in a lab. Um, and hopefully in the future, environmental DNA will, will make us find zebra and quagga mussels much earlier in water bodies, so that's the hope. Uh, you may have heard of moss balls in the news back in March, April, May. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of finalize with you regarding uh, zebra mussels that moss balls were found in pets, in pet smarts and pet coes throughout the US and in Canada to have zebra mussels with them. And so you'll notice on the right here, a, a moss ball. And if you're not familiar with the moss ball, I wasn't. It's circular like this. They often sell them in water, in containers of water, or they did. Um, in, in stores and they said, hey, put this with your betta fish. Um, you'll see a tank here on the bottom left that they actually sometimes put these moss balls in aquariums in pet stores as well. And it wasn't just pet cones, pet smarts, but um, that's how they found the first one in Seattle was at a pet smart. So what happened was 
immediately, um, thankfully, um, the states have pretty good co coordination and communication. And so emails went out to the different states. They immediately went to PetSmarts and Petco's and immediately we, we all found them. And our PetSmarts and Petco's across the whole new United States, really scary. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service and USDA APHIS um, and all the state um, you know, game and fish agencies have all come together since and I've identified some key points of how this happened and how we're gonna keep that from happening in the future. And a lot of steps need to keep, need to still happen, um, but just very interesting with all of our prevention with boat movement that this, um, this pathway, not only pet stores, but then of course online. And so things like Etsy and, and Amazon, these were being sold as well. So um, very interesting. If you wanna learn more, you can come to my website at the end here and, and I'd be happy to talk to you about moss balls. So just an interesting, um, new pathway that, yeah, we, we really weren't seeing. So I wanna hit on two more invasive species and then I'd be happy to take any questions from you. Um, so in Nebraska, we have three different aquatic invasive species, plant species that I wanted to make you aware of. And if you look at these pictures, you can, uh, you can imagine how having one of these aquatic invasive plants at your favorite place to go fishing or kayaking or boating or just enjoying would really hamper that. And so, they really kind of take over the whole water body. So Eurasian water milfoils on the left here. This is one that will persist in that lake all summer long. Um, so very devastating. And um, there are herbicides that you are allowed to treat some water bodies. But like I mentioned in Nebraska, we take water out of a lot of water bodies for drinking water, for irrigation, you know, for those kind of things. So some lakes you're not allowed to treat to kill these plants even. Um, so prevention again is really important with these. Curly leaf pondweed is one that's spread a lot by duck hunters on decoys and boats. Um, this is one that will actually start growing under the ice. And then after ice out, it will really uh, start growing. And then when, once it gets really hot in July, it, it will die off. Um, but this is one that will create complete mats. My parents uh, live up in Okaboji, Iowa. They have to pay somebody to actually, to actually break their lake so that they could take their boat out and then pay them to take it to landfill. So these, these, um, Plant problems, unfortunately, are really a problem because they have so many seeds as well. They create these seed banks um, that are just extremely hard to control. And then brittle naiad, this is one that um, just single parts of this plant can spread from one water body to another. So these are these uh, plants, it's important to clean, drain, and dry because just si single parts of the plants or uh, their seeds could be in mud. And so they very quickly can be moved by being on your, your fishing equipment, your boats, you know, anything like that. So it's important to remove any plant parts and mud. Um, they've actually found that these aquatic invasive plants can reduce property values by up to 16%. And this would be the boat on the right, the rake that I mentioned that actually they're raking that to then take it to the landfill so that they can actually, you know, use their kayaks. So please clean, drain and dry it for this reason as well. Finally, Asian carp, which you may, may have heard of are large fish that we have in our rivers in Nebraska. And um, we, we don't understand a lot about their, their locations out West. So there's some really great research that the Game Parks is funding right now with, with federal funds. And um, the problem with silver carp is they jump. So, so if you look on the picture here, these are silver carp. These are, these are um, agitated by boat motors. This is actually an electroshocking boat. And so it's really, uh, messing with them, making them jump, but they get they get scared with with the boat motors, and so they'll jump, and they actually can cause damage because they can get 50 pounds, and they can jump 10 feet in the air. So, silver carp are the ones that jump. If you've seen them in the in the water in the river systems in Nebraska or in Missouri or other states, uh, grass carp are carp that eat a lot of vegetation. So sometimes um, we've heard people recommending putting grass carp in a lake. Let's say if you have too much vegetation in that lake, please don't do that. Um, grass carp reproduce and they will just eat all the vegetation. And it's important to have some vegetation in your water body. So uh, grass carp are, are one that um, regionally we're trying to control. Black carp are actually ones that eat mollusks. So they will eat our snails and our native mussels. Um, they're coming our way. We've never found them in Nebraska. If you ever see one um, or think you see one, please submit a report to my website. We will check it out. Um, but these are coming our way from the South. And then big head carp, these guys can get 70 pounds. Um, they can have two, every female can lay two, can have 2 million eggs a year. 
Um, so with with silver and Asian with silver and big head carp in our river systems, currently we are doing a lot of research to find out their locations out west, how far they are in tributaries in our river systems. Um, and then once we learn more about that, uh, management will be in the future something that we will definitely be looking into. And so when we look at how to control Asian carp, unfortunately, it is a not one thing is going to solve it. These these fish grow very quickly. Um, very, they get very large. They eat a lot of, of um, zooplankton and plankton. They reproduce. And so it's not one uh, solution that takes care of all of them. And so that's why we're, we're grateful for some federal uh, funds from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that's now funding this research as well as some control uh, within the Midwest. So finally, please come to my website, anyinvasives.com. You can learn more about all the species we've talked about today and also other species, you know, plants, wildlife, animal, all those things. I have a lot of brochures and um, ID guides on the website, which you can feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to send you copies of those and other resources. And please keep me in mind in the future if you would like a presentation on something else or if you'd like any handout materials for any events you're doing. So with that, Lisa, I can hand it back to you if there's any questions. All right, thank you so much. I'm sorry, much. Laura. Sorry, Laura. It's okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, while everybody is thinking of their questions, I'm going to just start up a poll. Um, it would be really helpful if you guys fill it out. It's just three questions. It'll only take a couple minutes, even like just one minute. Um, and then we'll get started on questions while that's happening. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, so this is for the zebra mussels. Um, did they have any, like, what predators do they have in Europe? Yes, yeah, great question, thank you. Um, so they've looked, at, they've looked at a number of things in their home range. And so one thing would be, there's a number of fish species that eat these in their native range, including the round goby. And the round goby, unfortunately, is now in the Great Lakes as well because it hitched a ride over. Um, and so it's become invasive as well. So the round goby is not gonna probably be a good option for us to release to, to kill them in Nebraska. Um, but what they are looking at is the parasites that, that keep them in check there and, and diseases, because they're hopeful that with this Pseudomonas bacteria, the Zequinox, that that works so well, they're hoping that maybe there'll be a, a bacteria or, or a parasite that they find in that native range that potentially we could use over here to control them and that it wouldn't you know, harm anything else. So great question. And they're definitely looking more into that to find some biological control options. And then for um, anybody who does have a boat, is there, sorry, I had it written down. Um, so is there any in-person outreach like clinics that you do on how to specifically clean, dry and drain everything? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so currently I have two technicians out in the Lincoln and Omaha area um, and they're going to high use uh, water bodies. And then also I do a lot of webinars and, and, and presentations like this to groups that are interested. So I work with like the Nebraska Lake Association and, and groups like that. So if you have any groups that you'd like me to come and talk to, show them how to inspect boats, anything like that, I'm happy to do so. Um, in terms of things that are actually planned, I, I can't think of anything. It's just more of kind of expos and, and events that I'll be going to, but I'm always available to do those kind of things if there's a, a need for it. Okay. And um, I know you personally sent me an email for a meeting tomorrow, but are those open to the public? Yes, yes. So our Nebraska Invasive Species Council meeting, uh, we meet the second Friday every month. We're taking August off, but come to my website um, and we'll put, we put information on every one of those meetings on the website. Uh, it's free for anybody to come and it's a really laid back meeting. We normally have a featured presenter on an invasive species topic. And then we, and then all of the council members and, and partners are there. And so we all just talk, you know, what's new in the invasive species world and what concerns do we have um, and, and keep each other praised of what's new. So if you would like to be part of the invasive species council, please, please hop on my website and contact me. I'd be happy to let you know and, and welcome you to our week, our monthly meetings. Awesome. And for everybody watching, the link to that website is in the chat. Um, we do have a question from Andrea. She says that they are avid paddlers and have you ever presented to local kayaking groups? Yes, I have not to local kayakers, but I'd love to. I know that my technicians have talked to a lot of them in the Lincoln Omaha areas, but I'm all about doing outreach. So yes, please let me know if there's any groups and I would be happy to 
I'll reach out to them and, and do some outreach with them. That would be great. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. And then we did have some people miss the very beginning of the presentation today. So could you just summarize the impacts that zebra mussels have? Sure. Let me just go back real quick so I can graphically show you that. Um, there we go. Okay. So zebra and quagga mussels, they're really harmful in a lot of ways. And so one way would just be um, if you're a boater and you own a, a, a motorboat, for example, um, the larva can get in the intakes and grow and overheat your motor or just grow on it and, you know, completely encapsulate it like this. So one, one thing that zebra and quagga mussels do is they will cause issues to motorboats. Uh, zebra mussels have extremely sharp shells and so do quagga mussels and they will cut your feet. So if you ever go fishing somewhere or you like to go uh, swimming or, or go to a beach, if you get zebra quagga mussels, you're gonna have to wear water shoes if you go in the water. If you go to the beach, you might have to pay somebody to actually rake the beach and get rid of those. Um, zebra mussels, each one of them, every single one of them, filter feeds a liter of water a day. And that takes out all that, that plankton out of that water column, which, which starves that system. So all the other uh, aquatic species don't have that base of the food chain to eat. So it, it has cascading effects in the food web. Uh, we pay a lot of, of money um, to keep power plants, for example, clear and running. Uh, if they bring in water that has zebra quagga mussels, so the Missouri River has zebra mussels. Uh, OPPD has a facility that they actually have had to retrofit and put chemicals in it to keep their pipes clean and also they have to manually clean out the system uh, to remove their their shells and so that's actually a cost to people in, in Omaha that get power from that facility so even if you're not a boater or fish or you know like fishing and you don't like going to lakes you might care about your power bill so that's one thing that I like to tell people is this does have a bigger impact than just uh, boating and fishing. And then similarly, they like to clog pipes. So if we were to get these uh, zebra mussels in, let's say, um, a lake in western Nebraska, that water is being pulled out for irrigation, they would have to do something with those pipes to keep those clear, which of course increase costs um, and also can break systems. So um, very concerning, especially in Nebraska with all of our irrigation that we, that we need to do, um, that these can be a big issue. And then, of course, they, they impact other aquatic species, including our native mussels, which are really important. Uh, the zebra mussels will grow on them and keep them from being able to, to open uh, and feed. And so they have impacts to that as well. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, he also continued on with the question. I didn't read the that earlier. Sorry about that. Um, he wanted to know if the overpopulation has gotten out of hand in any situation and what that works can they and got to the worst case scenario, and then what was the worst case scenario? Okay, so um, if if we're talking about the worst case scenario in terms of cost to, I can I can talk to you about Gavin's Point Dam, for example. So Lewis and Clark Lake, which is on, it's in uh, right here. So Lewis and Clark Lake, which is right by Yankton, South Dakota. It's a border water with Nebraska and South Dakota. We have Gavin's Point Dam, which is a hydrologic dam right there owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. When we got zebra mussels there, not only did they attach themselves to every boat dock, every boat and every sailboat, but they also started clogging that, that hydroelectric facility to the point that they had to put in a UV light system that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, almost a million, I believe. And what that does is they now have a UV light system that all the water coming into that dam goes under that will mutate the larva, the zebra mussel larva, and make them pass through the facility so that they don't get clogged. They won't clog that, that um, hydrologic facility, that hydro dam, okay? Um, and then every year they have to replace some of those light bulbs because they'll burn out. And so that's just one example of a cost that the core had to endure because these zebra mussels became infested in that a water body. Um, and of course, there's many other impacts that that's having for anybody pulling out municipal water as well. They're, they have to retrofit their system and that's an annual cost that they will forever have to put into that. Yeah, that's expensive. Yeah, very expensive, unfortunately, very expensive. And then we had a question from Autumn. Um, she's a conservation biology student and she lives in Wayne, Nebraska. Um, what can she do to help? She's been having a hard time finding people to re reach out and talk to. Sure. Thank you for your interest. Um, I would love to talk to you online, offline more. 
um, and I can put my, I'll put my stuff up. Um, I think it's important to talk to anybody you know that, that goes fishing, that boats, um, that has interest in doing so or traveling somewhere to just make them aware of zebra and quagga mussels and how they are spread from one water body to another. And that let's say that you know somebody that's coming from Kansas. Kansas has 34 water bodies with zebra mussels. And so um, having just knowing people that are there are kayak canoers, any anything on water really uh, making them aware of this would be really helpful. Um, and like I said, feel free to reach out, um, out to me offline too. And I'd be happy to talk more about this with you. Um, so we had one from Mar. Uh, she wants to know what the best way we can eradicate zebra mussels. Like, is there out east, is there more stuff going on where they found something or? Yeah, and that's that's a great thing. So out, out east, um, they are doing a lot of research. And one of the part, one of the things they're doing that I talked about is that environmental DNA. So that even at stream gauges, which we have all over, um, you may or may not be aware, um, we have stream gauges all over in Nebraska and other states. And so they're actually working on systems that would automatically take water samples at those stream ga gauges and test them and take those to sample for, for zebra and quagga mussels and maybe even other uh, species. So that's really exciting research that just is, is underway for the last couple of years. Um, and then the Zequinox and the Earth Tech QZ, those would be examples of a bacteria and a copper product that they're doing more tests on um, to find out how that can be used in a more open water setting. And so, like I said, with a closed water setting, like in pipes or, or a power facility, they have some good solutions that work really well. But when we look at a lake, you know, an open, you know, large lake, there is not a chemical that I can pour in that lake that will that will kill these zebra mussels at the bottom of the lake. And so that is the true challenge that um, USDA has actually put um, millions of dollars out for research just to get new ideas even. So we really do not have um, that silver bullet right now, but just be sure that there's lots of exciting research happening. And I'm hopeful in the future, we will have some solutions. All right. Um, are you taking any volunteers? Um, we have some master naturalists here uh, who who would like to volunteer. Sure. Um, and so I would be happy to, to talk to you about um, different opportunities. Um, definitely with, like I said, I have two people doing watercraft inspections. And so if you'd like to go out with them and learn more. Um, and also I could I could look at other opportunities as well. So please reach out to me and um, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you to, to find out some ways that we can work together. Awesome. And then has there been any research that you've tried against them that they've just become resistant to? So they become resistant to anything? Was that the question? Yes. Yeah. So to my knowledge, there's nothing they've been resistant to. It's the fact that they clam up and they won't eat it. So it's, it's that they, they'll try the, Z, the Zequinox or the copper product that we want them to eat. And they'll just, they'll spit it out and not eat it. And then just, they don't need to eat for 30 days. So that's the problem we have is um, in the lab, it works fine because they keep this um, high concentration of that, that chemical right on them and they, then they kill them. But in that open water system, we just can't keep that uh, concentration on the bottom of the lake to kill them all. And so mm -hmm. it really is, that's the trick is keeping the concentration and making it something to eat. And that's why that dead bacteria works just great because it's not, Harm, they don't identify that as a chemical versus some chemicals are like, nope, that's chemical, I'm not eating it. So that seems to be the trick, not the, they're being resistant to anything. It's more of actually getting them to eat it and it doing the trick, so. They're kind of like toddlers sometimes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're too, they're too smart. That's, I think, yeah, just tricky. Very good. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So that's all that they had for now. But if anybody else has some, some questions, please put it in and we'll get that answered. And then you answered all my questions I had as well. So awesome. great. We'll give them maybe another minute or two. Yeah. Um, thank and you again, everyone. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, just keep me in mind. Like I said, if you have any invasive species um, outreach needs or training, just be in touch with me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Of course. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we did uh, record this presentation. So it will be up on the Nebraska Conservation website here in a couple days and maybe 
next week. Um, I can put that in the chat for everybody, or you can just look up Nebraska Conservation or Conservation Nebraska uh, on Google. And then you've gotten many thank yous for the presentation. Awesome. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right. Well, since it doesn't seem like many people have any more questions, I think we can just end it here. So thank you again, Allison. Um, have a great weekend. Enjoy the weather this weekend. And just have a good night. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Thanks, everybody.